the humanist tradition of the 19th century. Hamilton, Comte, and J.S. Mill. A History of Modern Philosophy, Book 16. The philosophical movement of the 19th century, after the collapse of German idealism, has not been dominated by any single master or any single direction to anything like the same extent as its predecessors. But if we are called on to select the dominant note by which all its products have been more or less coloured and characterised, none more impressive than the note of humanism can be named. As applied to the culture of the Renaissance, humanism meant a tendency to concentrate interest on this world rather than on the next, using classic literature as the best means of understanding what man had been and again might be. At the period on which we were entering human interests again become ascendant, but they assume the widest possible range, claiming for their dominion the whole of experience, all that has ever been done or known or imagined or dreamed or felt. Hegel's inventory, in a sense, embraced all this, but Hegel had a way of packing his trunk that sometimes crushed the contents out of recognition and a way of opening it that few could understand. Besides, much was left out of the trunk that could ill be spared by mankind. Aristotle has well said that the soul is in a way everything, and as such its analysis, under the name of psychology, has entered largely into the philosophy of the century. Theory of knowledge, together with logic, has figured copiously in academic courses, with the result of putting what is actually known before the student in a new and interesting light, but with the result also of developing so much pedantry and scepticism as to give many besides dull fools the impression that divine philosophy is both crabbed and harsh. The French Eclectics In the two centuries after Descartes' France, so great in science, history and literature, have produced no original philosopher, although general ideas derived from English thought were extensively circulated for the purpose of discrediting the old order in church and state. When this work had been done with a thoroughness going far beyond the intention of the first reformers, a reaction set in, and the demand arose for something more conservative than the so-called sensualism and materialistic atheism of the pre-revolutionary times. A certain originality and speculative disinterestedness must be allowed to Maine de Biran, 1766-1824, who, some years after Fichte, but, as would seem, independently of him, referred to man's voluntary activity as a source of a priori knowledge. A greater immediate impression was produced by Royer Collard, 1763-1845, who, as professor at the Sorbonne in 1811, imported the common-sense spiritualism of Reed, 1710-1796, as an antidote to the then reigning theories of Condillac, 1715-1780, who, improving on Locke, abolished reflection as a distinct source of our ideas. Then came Victor Cousin, 1792-1867, a brilliant rhetorician, and, after Madame de Stael, the first to popularise German philosophy in France. As professor at the Sorbonne in the last years of the Bourbon monarchy, he distinctly taught a pantheistic absolutism compounded of Schelling and Hegel. But whether from conviction or opportunism, this was silently withdrawn, and a so-called eclectic philosophy put in its place. According to Cousin, in all countries and all ages, from ancient India to modern Europe, Speculation has developed under the four contrasted forms of sensualism, idealism, scepticism and mysticism. Each is true in what it asserts, false in what it denies, and the right method is to preserve the positive while rejecting the negative elements of all four. But neither the master nor his disciples have ever consistently answered the vital question what those elements are. Hamilton and the philosophy of the conditioned among other valuable contributions to the history of philosophy, Victor Cousin had lectured very agreeably on the philosophy of Kant, accepting the master's arguments for the apriorism of space and time, but rejecting his reduction of them to mere subjective forms as against common sense. He had not gone into Kant's destructive criticism of all metaphysics, and this was now to be turned against him by an unexpected assailant. 
Sir William Hamilton, 1788 to 1856, afterwards widely celebrated as Professor of Logic and Metaphysics at Edinburgh, began his philosophical career by an essay on The Philosophy of the Conditioned in the Edinburgh Review for October 1829, controverting the absolutism both of Cousin and of his master, Schelling. The reviewer had acquired some not very accurate knowledge of Kant in Germany ten years before, and he uses this, with other rather flimsy erudition, to establish the principle that to think is to condition, and that therefore the absolute cannot be thought, cannot be conceived. Hamilton enjoyed the reputation of having read all that mortal man had ever written about philosophy, but this evidently did not include Hegel, who certainly had performed the feat declared to be impossible. Thirty years later, the philosophy of the conditioned attained a sudden but transient notoriety, thanks to the use made of it by Hamilton's disciple, H. L. Mansell, in his Bampton Lectures on the Limits of Religious Thought, 1858. The object of these was to prove that, as we know nothing about things in themselves, nothing told about God in the Bible or the creeds can be rejected a priori as incredible. As an apology, the book failed utterly, its only effect being to prepare public opinion for the agnosticism of Herbert Spencer and Huxley. Auguste Comte the brilliant audiences that hung spellbound on the lips of Victor Cousin as he unrolled before them the infinite, the finite, and the relation between the two, little knew that France's only great philosopher since Descartes was working in obscurity among them. Auguste Comte, 1798-1857, the founder of positivism, belonged to a Catholic and legitimist family. By profession, a mathematical teacher, he fell early under the influence of the celebrated St. Simon, a mystical socialist who exercised a powerful attraction on others besides Comte. The connection lasted four years, when they quarrelled. Indeed, Comte's character was such as to make permanent cooperation with him impossible, except on terms of absolute agreement with his opinions and submission to his will. At a subsequent period, he obtained some fairly well-paid employment at the École Polytechnique, but lost it again owing to the injurious terms in which he spoke of his colleagues. In his later years, he lived on a small annuity made up by contributions from his admirers. Auguste Comte disliked and despised Plato, altogether preferring Aristotle to him as a philosopher, but it is fundamentally as a Platonist, not as an Aristotelian, that he should himself be classed, in this sense, that he valued knowledge above all as the means towards reconstituting society on the basis of an ideal life. And this is the first reason why his philosophy is called positive, to distinguish it as reconstructive from the purely negative thought of the revolution. The second reason is to distinguish it as dealing with real facts from the figments of theology and the abstractions of metaphysics. Positive science explains natural events neither by the intervention of supernatural beings nor by the mutual relations of hypostasis concepts, but by verifiable laws of succession and resemblance. Turgot was the first to distinguish the theological, metaphysical, and mechanical interpretations as successive stages of a historical evolution, 1750. Hume was the first to single out the relations of orderly succession and resemblance as the essential elements of real knowledge, 1739. Comte, with the synthetic genius of the 19th century, first combined these isolated suggestions with a wealth of other ideas into a vast theory of human progress set out in the fifth and sixth volumes of his Philosophy Positive, the best sketch of universal history ever written. The positive sciences fall into two great divisions, the concrete, dealing with the actual phenomena as presented in space and time, the abstract, which alone concern philosophy, dealing with their laws. The most important of the abstract sciences is sociology, claimed by Comte as his own special creation. The study of this demands a previous knowledge of biology, psychology being dismissed as a metaphysical delusion and phrenology put in its place. The science of life presupposes chemistry, before which comes physics, presupposing astronomy and, as the basis of all, mathematics, 
divided into the calculus and geometry. At a later period, morality was placed as a seventh fundamental science at the head of the whole hierarchy. At a first glance, some serious flaws reveal themselves in the imposing logic of this scheme. Astronomy as a concrete science ought to have been excluded from the series, its admission being apparently due to the historical circumstance that the most general laws of physics were ascertained through the study of celestial phenomena. But on the same ground, geology can no longer be excluded, as its records led to the recognition of the evolution of life. Or should evolution be referred to the concrete sciences of zoology and botany, by parity of reasoning human progress should be treated as a branch of universal history, which, in fact, is what Kant makes it in his fifth and sixth volumes. It would have been better had he also studied social statics on the historical method. As it is, the volume in which the conditions of social equilibrium are supposed to be established contains only one chapter on the subject and that is very meagre, consisting of some rather superficial observations on family life and the division of labour. No doubt the matter receives a far more thorough discussion in the author's later work, Politique Positive, but this merely embodies his own plan of reorganisation for the society of the future, and therefore should count not as science, but as art. The positivist theory of social dynamics is that all branches of knowledge pass through three successive stages already described as the theological, the metaphysical, and the scientific. And this advance is accompanied by a parallel evolution on the governmental side from the military to the industrial regime, with a revolutionary or transitional period answering to metaphysical philosophy. To this scheme, it might be objected that the parallelism is merely accidental. A scientific view of nature and a profound knowledge of her laws is no doubt far more conducive to industry than a superstitious view. But it is also more favourable to the successful prosecution of war, which indeed always has been an industry like another. Nor, to judge by modern experience, does it look as if a government placed in the hands of a country's chief capitalists, which was what Kant proposed, would be less militant in its general disposition than the parliamentary governments which he condemns as metaphysical. In fact, it is by theologians and metaphysicians that our modern horror of war has been inspired rather than by scientists. The great idea of Kant's life, that the positive sciences, philosophically systematized, are destined to supply the basis of a new religion surpassing Catholicism in its social efficacy, seems a delusion really inherited from one of his pet aversions, Plato. It arose from a profound misconception of what Catholicism had done, and a misconception, equally profound, of the means by which its priesthood worked. In spite of Kant's denials, the leverage was got not by appeals to the heart, but by appeals to that future judgment with which the preaching of righteousness and temperance was associated by St. Paul, his supposed precursor in religion, as Aristotle was his precursor in philosophy. The worship of humanity, or, as it has been better called, the service of man, is a great and inspiring thought. Only it is not a religion, but a metaphysical idea, derived by Kant from the philosophers of the 18th century, and by them through imperial Rome from the humanists and Stoics of ancient Athens. J. S. Mill, John Stuart Mill, 1806 to 1873, was, like Comte, a Platonist in the sense of valuing knowledge chiefly as an instrument of social reform. He was indeed bred up by his father, James Mill, 1773 to 1836, and by Jeremy Bentham as a prophet of the new utilitarianism, as Comte was, to some extent, trained by St. Simon to substitute a new order for that which the revolution had destroyed. Mill, however, had been educated on the lines of Greek liberty rather than in the tradition of Roman authority, while both were largely affected by the Romanticism current in their youth. The worship of women, revived from the age of chivalry, entered into the Romantic movement, and it may be mentioned in this connection that Mill calls Mrs. Taylor, the lady with whom he fell in love at twenty-four and married eighteen years later, the inspirer and in part the author of all that was best in his writings, while Comte refers his religious conversion to Madame Clotilde de Vaux, the object of his adoration in middle life. 
It seems probable, however, from the little we know of Mrs. Taylor, whom Carlyle credits with the keenest insight and the royalist volition, that her influence was the reverse of Clotilde's. If anything, she attached Mill still more firmly to the cause of pure reason. It has been mentioned how Kant's metaphysical agnosticism was played out by Hamilton against Cousin. A little later, Huell, the Cambridge historian of physical science, imported Kant's theory of necessary truth in opposition to the empiricism of popular English thought and Kant's categorical imperative in still more express contradiction to Bentham's utilitarian morality. Now, Mill, educated as he had been on the associationist psychology and in the central line of the English epistemological tradition, rejected the German apriorism as false in itself, while more particularly hating it as, in his opinion, a dangerous enemy to all social progress. For to him, what people called their intuitions, whether theoretic or practical, were merely the time-honoured prejudices in which they had been brought up and the contradictory of which they could not conceive. Kant similarly interpreted the metaphysical stage of thought as the erection into immutable principles of certain abstract ideas whose value, if they had any, was merely relative and provisional. Mill, with his knowledge of history, might have remembered that past thought, beginning with Plato, shows no such connection between intuitionism and immobility or reaction, while such experientialists as Hobbes and Hume have been political Tories. But in his own time, the a priori philosophy went hand in hand with conservatism in church and state, so he set himself to explode it in his system of logic, 1843. Mill's logic, the most important English contribution to philosophy since Hume, is based on Hume's theory of knowledge, amended and supplemented by some German and French ideas. It is conceded to Kant that mathematical truths are synthetic, not analytic. It is not contained in the idea of two and two that they make four, nor in the idea of two straight lines that they cannot enclose a space. Such propositions are real additions to our knowledge, but it is only experience that justifies us in accepting them. What constitutes their peculiar certainty is that they can be verified by trial on imagined numbers and lines without reference to external objects. But by what right we generalize from mental experience to all experience Mill does not explain. Hume's analysis of causation into antecedents and sequence of phenomena is accepted by Mill as it was accepted by Kant, but the law that every change must have a cause is affirmed in adhesion to Dr. Thomas Brown, 1778-1820, with more distinctness than by Hume. As Laplace put it, the whole present state of the universe is a product of its whole preceding state, but we only know this truth by experience and we can conceive a state of things where phenomena succeed one another by a different law or without any law at all. Mill himself was ready to believe that causation did not obtain at some very remote point of space, though what difference remoteness could make, except we suppose it to be causal, which would be a reassertion of the law, he does not explain, nor yet what warrant we have for assuming that causation holds through all time or at any future moment of time. Next to the law of universal causation, inductive science rests on the doctrine of natural kinds. The material universe is known to consist of a number of substances, namely the chemical elements and their combinations, so constituted that a certain set of characteristic properties are invariably associated with an indefinite number of other properties. Thus, if in a strange country a certain mineral answers the usual tests for arsenic, we know that a given dose of it will destroy life, and we are equally certain that if the spectroscopic examination of a new star shows the characteristic lines of iron, a metal possessing all the properties of iron as we find it in our minds is present in that distant luminary. According to Mill, we are justified in drawing that sweeping inference on the strength of a single well-authenticated observation, because we know by innumerable observations on terrestrial substances that natural kinds possessing such index qualities do exist, whereas there is not a single instance of a substance possessing those qualities without the rest. For Mill, 
As for Hume, reality means states of consciousness and the relations between them. Matter he defines as a permanent possibility of sensation, mind as a permanent possibility of thought and feeling. But the latter definition is admittedly not satisfactory. For a stream of thoughts and feelings which is proved by memory to have the consciousness of itself seems to be something more than a mere stream. All explanations must end in an ultimate inexplicability. God may be conceived as a series of thoughts and feelings prolonged through eternity, and it is a logically defensible hypothesis that the order of nature was designed by such a being, although the amount of suffering endured by living creatures excludes the notion of a creator at once beneficent and omnipotent. And if the Darwinian theory were established, the case for a designing intelligence would collapse. Personally, Mill believed neither in a god nor in a future life. In morals, Mill may be considered the creator of what Henry Sidgwick, in his Methods of Ethics, 1874, called universalistic hedonism. The English moralists of the 18th century had set up the greatest happiness of the greatest number as the ideal end of action. But they did not hold that each individual could be expected to pursue anything but his own happiness. The object of Bentham, 1748 to 1832, being to make the two coincide. Kant showed that the rule of right excluded any such accommodation, and a crisis in his own life led Mill to adopt the same conclusion. Afterwards, he rather confused the issues by distinguishing between higher and lower pleasures, leaving experts to decide which were the pleasures to be preferred. The universalistic standard settles the question summarily by estimating pleasures according to their social utility. Mill fully sympathised with Comte's demand for social reorganisation as a means towards the moral end. But, with his English and Protestant traditions, he had no faith in the creation of a new spiritual power with an elaborate religious code and ritual as the best machinery for the purpose. In his opinion, the claims of the individual to extended liberty of thought and action, not their restriction, were what first needed attention. Second to this, if second at all, came the necessity for reforming representative government on the lines of an enlarged franchise and a readjusted electoral system with plural suffrage determined by merit, votes for women, and a contrivance for giving minorities a weight proportion to their numbers. The problem of poverty was to be dealt with by restrictions on the increase of population and on the amount of inheritable property, the maximum of which ought not to exceed a modest competence. Among the noble characters presented by the history of philosophy, we may distinguish between the heroic and the saintly types. To the former in modern times belong Giordano Bruno, Fichte, and to some extent Comte, to the latter Spinoza, Berkeley, and Kant. To the second class we may surely add John Stuart Mill, whom Gladstone called the saint of rationalism, and of whom Auguste Logel said, he was not sincere, he was sincerity itself.